I'm going to talk about the project I've been working on for, uh, for the past few months. It's, it's a very small project, experimental, uh, but hopefully of uh, interest to this audience. So uh, this is called Bleepy, and it's an experiment in which you actually take from this. So basically, this is the main problem. We have like this font, which I have one. They have this good representation as pages or lines. And we want to get them on the screen. So how do we do that? So what we do right now in, in pretty much every step, well, but to, to keep things simple, like using free types on Linux or even Android phone, most pretty much everything uh, we free software people care about. What we do is we apply the heating and stuff, which just the output. And then we rasterize it on the CPU, given a font size or transformation, and then upload this to a piece of text memory on the GPU and then just show it. The main problem with this, uh, this setting is that this is all transformation dependent, which means if you have rotating text or uh, more commonly on, on smartphones and tablets, text changing size and stuff. What you end up doing is to you, you keep re-rasterizing text at every different transformation and uploading it to the CPU. That comes with a lot of memory dynamics and cache memory and such. So, uh, and because you have to cache all these clicks at these different transformations, you can't afford doing simple things like sub pixel positioning. And because of that, this is what you get when you are rotating your text. This is what we call it weekly text. That happens because every place is only rendered once at uh, integer pixel positions and you don't get your uh, animation. So that's kind of what I wanted to look into. Try to add this. So let's make the text beautiful. <laughs> yes. But, uh, but if you've been looking into this space, like Many, many people much smarter than me have been looking into the past 20, 30 years, especially at Microsoft and Apple and Adobe. And uh, there should be a reason if this is what we get today. So what we want, what we decided to do was to relax the assumption and say, we have a high density display, which supposedly is the future. I don't know, not much, but let's see. And uh, let's say we don't have to worry about hinting at a really, really small size. What can we do better given the where the hardware is going and where our smartphones and tablets and displays are going? So uh, this was a project to find out. Let's say we don't have to worry about anything. So uh, we have this play sheet, right? And Historically, what we've been doing in free time in Cairo and pretty much any rasterization engine I know is what we call the coverage based raster, uh, actually obviously. And then uh, I will introduce this other way to do things, which is a finite central based algorithm. So, what's a coverage based anti aliasing? Basically, the idea is you have your outline and you have your pixel. And you just calculate how much of the pixel is covered by the outline, and then you assign a number between 0 and 1. And that determines the shade of gray you want to use for the pixel. So that's what Rita does, Carlo does, pretty much everyone. And I make a point that this assumes that pixels are blurred, which wasn't true with CRT display, but it's kind of true with LCD. But uh, there's this other way to rasterize outline, and let's call it the sign distance field based approach. The idea of the sign distance field is the sign distance field is a mathematical function from the space to a real number. And what it describes is the distance to the closest point on the outline. And it's signed in that it's positive if you are outside the image and negative if you're inside. So for the, the idea here is if you if you think of your pixel as a Gaussian and if you have the distance of the pixel to the closest point in the 
outlet. Then based on that distance, you can decide what color to assign to this pixel. If it's far outside, you just say, okay, white. If it's far inside, it's black. And otherwise, you assign the shade of gray based on a, like a ramp kind of thing. So this is the idea of the assignment uh, sense fail based rasterization. And the reason we, we like this is that if you if you have a way to represent this function, the sign distance well, it's fairly linearly independent of uniform scaling and rotation. So that's that's the main uh, benefit of this approach that we're going to uh, to look into. So. This is a representation of the sign distance well uh, for a given A glyph. You see like the, the red or the wine shape is inside the glyph negative and the green is outside. So now the, the question, if we can somehow compute this function or represent it uh, fastly, we can convert this to a glyph faster or just apply that smooth step function. But now, Many people have looked into this problem before. The way they ended up representing the function itself is by sampling. So you sample it to a 32 by 32 grid, and then you buy the interpolation and the GPU to get to your function. But then there's two problems with this approach. One, this the usual sampling artifacts at large size that you, you lose details, like your sharp corner does not sharp anymore. And then at small size, it doesn't work either because it's just not the uh, fine detail enough. So what we wanted to do, we didn't want to do any sampling. So we said, okay, if you have the outline, what most people do is they, they go from the outline to a raster image and then try to go from the raster to a sign distance sample and then try to reconstruct the actual sphere from the sample. It's stupid. But we have the outline in mathematical form. Why can't we just use it to find the closest distance? Well, the, the real answer is because basically there is not the easiest to find distance to. You have to call the 50 feet or something. So we said, okay, let's, let's step back. This is uh, are mathematically easy to work with in many ways. Maybe we can transform them to another form that is easier to compute distance to. And if you think about it, circular arc comes to mind because distance to circular arc is so easy to, to, to compute. So this is now, now, now we are going from the, bit, the outline is given in a Bezier analyzed format to this convert it to a set of circular arcs. So the first thing we did was to, to develop a mathematically sound uh, error function to compute the error between a given circle bar and a Bezier. After doing that, we used just generic subdivision base or other forms of algorithms to convert uh, a, a, a Bezier plot to a circle arc plot. And so we got many, uh, we got good enough results. Now you, you can set the tolerance and then convert this complex busy shape to four or five simple arcs. And the shade of green there actually shows the number of arcs that are closest to those points. The reason you see some points are closest to two arcs is because, because of the errors. But if you want better approximation, you can just you fit the tolerance and you get more arcs by this error. So with all this, we can now convert the cliff representation from Bezier's to an uh, arc supply. And having that, we can compute the distance to the cliff fairly easily, except that, well, you have to compare it to like all these if this is the arcs now. So now we've represented the sign distance scale in a way that is easy to calculate the, the SDF, but not fast enough. So this is an example of what, what this gets us. This is the place in circular arcs and the representation of the SDF. But now if you want to use this on the GPU raster steps, 
we need to be able to find that distance so fast that we can afford doing it for every pixel. And given this, we can because like you have 60 yards, comparing the distance, like calculating the distance from every pixel to 60 yards is just not going to do it. And uh, there's some complexities around the sign part of the thing. If you're not careful, you kind of lose whether you're inside or outside. The important case is, as you go in any of the graphics algorithm, but, but those can be worked out. So now, uh, this is, again, the shade of green shows how many arcs you may find closest to you. The thing to appreciate here is that most of the area of the cliff is like only cares about one arc. There's just one arc, you know, this is the same arc is the closest arc to all the pixels in this area. So the way we approach this this engineering problem is we say, okay, let's let's do a very close grid on top of the grid and for each cell just record which arcs we care about. If, like, for example, you're, you're here, it's fairly clear that this arc is the closest to all the area in this area. So that's the only arc you care about. And if you, you, if you approach the problem this way, you come up with this smaller grid that, uh, that brings your search down to one, two, hopefully three arcs per cell. So if, if I have this kind of grid, now think about it, if you want to render the grid, you have a pixel. You just transform the pixel sensor into this grid uh, coordinate and just uh, say you fall here. And this one tells you, you know what, this is the arc you, you care about. And then you calculate the distance of your arc and decide what colors show. And that's exactly what we do. So we, we calculate all the arcs on the CPU, we calculate the grid on the CPU, and then come up with this binary block. We upload it to the texture memory on the GPU. And then when you want to render text, independent of the transformation, for every pixel, we just convert it to this clip space, find all the arcs that we care about, compute the distance to the arc, and assign color. So this is basically what we do. And this shape is showing uh, that no matter how close your grid is, there will be some points that are left just closest to different arcs. <laughs> no matter, so you can't just optimize this by going uh, finer grid, but we, we also observe that for this algorithm, for text rendering, you don't really care about those far distances. It's just you care about like one or two pixels from the shape boundary because after that it's either all white or all black. So, so what we can optimize here, we say like, you know what, we don't care about this. It's just, if it's too far from the shape, we just do nothing. So when you do that optimize, optimize, optimize again, you basically finally get down to uh, something that can actually run. So when I did this talk in December internally, we I had 50k per cliff here. Now I've got it down to 3k. In fact, then I had like about 50 texture pitches per pixel, but I've got it down to three. So so basically the processing we are doing on the CPU is fast enough. It can be faster, but it's fast enough. But then uh, we store each cliff as a binary blob on the texture memory. And for, for usual like, regular desktop fonts, I've got it down to about two point something uh, kilobytes per cliff and less than three texture features per pixel. Now, when I say less than three texture features per pixel, I should emphasize that the current algorithm that we use use exactly one texture fetch per pixel. And it's because they exactly have the raster prepared for that transformation. And it just, it's just a bleeding. And the bleeding is like one texture phase and no map. So there's no way my algorithm can go faster than that. But the question is whether we can go fast enough. So there's also limitations to this approach. The main one, well, other than being very mass heavy on the GPU, we do like hundreds of operations per pixel. 
there's also driver bikes. Like when I was developing this, I was I started on Linux. After a while, my shader was not compiling on Linux Intel anymore, so I continued development on the Mac using NVIDIA, and then. Then we decided to go back and look at the Intel one, why it doesn't work. And there were driver bikes in the shader compiler. Fortunately, Eric Hanho fixed that by optimizing the compiler. So Intel got working on Linux again. Then we tried to look into AMD on Mac. We hit a driver bike, this time not open source. So we had to kind of work around it. So it's like every Every platform we want to bring up, we have to like, bring up. It's pushing the limits of what shaders do. Uh, but perhaps the biggest problem with this approach is that the speed and memory consumption is font dependent. And that's worth thinking about because, like, with like, today and next year and two years from now, web fonts are getting rendered in the browser. And with, with this algorithm, if the font is more complex, you are going to be slowed down or consume more memory. Whereas with the old one, as memory hungry as that was, it only depended on like what size you are rendering text on. And speaking of which, so we tried to make this fast enough, fast enough, fast enough for normal fonts. And we had like some tricky fonts, the quick fonts. But uh, a few weeks ago, someone released a font on the body for testing, and it has blue like this one, <laughs> which is, when I counted, a hundred times more complex than your usual capital letter B. So, right now, there's no way I'm going to render this one. <laughs> no, it's not like it, it required like. 300, 400 texture pressure, then on the Mac, after 30 or 40, the, the driver just shuts down. Which is true. <laughs> which is true. Otherwise, but on Linux, it's worse. If you do, if you take too much time computing in the GPU, it kills the process. <laughs> which means my X is gone, but it doesn't, but my X is gone anyway. But it doesn't come back up, and you have to reboot anyway. So, <laughs> But, uh, but I can make a point here. Uh, it's also worth, so why do I want this to be able to render, to grasp at every frame so you get smooth animation and stuff? It's also the case that you can look at it as a new rasterizer. So if you were used to caching with rasters, you can still cache with rasters. It's also the case that your raster is can happen in the GPU. So many people correctly point out that most things you look at is like fixed size, same sizes again and again. And yes, that's true. You still can have some caching going on with this algorithm, but when so that's up to your caching uh, uh, mechanism to decide whether to cache this one or just let the GPU do it. So where are we ending with this? Basically, to be honest, this was kind of a let go just see if you can make anything better kind of project. But we are working on integrating this to SIA, which enables us to run Chrome on it and Chrome OS on it. And that that's basically what I do is they support the development of Chrome OS in my Google. And then uh, high-end Android devices or iPhone devices. Those devices are the actual ones that have like really scaling text all the time. And they are fine enough that they may afford doing this. What the only another example uh, is for example if you've seen the demo of the Google Maps uh, web tier based version that lets you uh, interact with the map. Uh, do fancy things. The, the way they run the text is a sign this based approach. It's just using samplings. So this is what one place can put that into. Or Google Docs, you can imagine. And so, uh, I also want to note that I use this project called MScripting, which converts LLVM bytecode to JavaScript. So I've got like a 
demo of this code, converting to JavaScript, running your browser using WebGL. And then in general, any open geo based application uh, in the future, I may look into integrating into the GNOME stack. But uh, I do want to point out that this is more of a, if you have, if you know what your device is and what your display is and what your driver is, you may choose to use this one, as opposed to replacing what we have. It's not going to replace the free but in terms of that cost. And uh, well, we're working into making it faster, much faster. It's, we're within like a factor of two or three of what, as fast as we can get. So it's not like we can make it 10 times faster, but maybe we can make that fancy the actual render. We may be looking to stop with the rendering, but I'm not really interested in it because we are aiming this for like high density displays and like 200 DPI plus. So at that scale, it doesn't really matter if you do something so rendering. But on the more academic side of things, as I said, it's like the SDF is uniform scaling independent. Like, so if you have non uniform scaling, you, you get the usual non-uniform anti-alias, and so that's the other thing to look into. And we know how to do it, it's just we haven't done it yet. And, well, there was... <laughs> Any questions before I pick this up? But, have you made any considerations for hinting, and making it also do some form of hinting? So, that's a good question, like, I hate hinting. <laughs> <laughs> so I started this project saying, like, you know what, screw hinting. But, <laughs> because I like, like, linear design, linearly transformable yeah. text layout. And everyone wants that. And, like, 160 DPI plus, it looks feasible. But then, whenever, like, exactly, like, whenever, I do this stuff, I start by saying that I don't care about hinting, and the first question is, do you want to do hinting? So, uh, yes, I know, if the application decides to, they can feel the hinted outline, that works as you expect. On the other hand, there are, there are like similar solutions, similar products, not free of those, that do hinting and using the SDF case hours and the results look really fancy, like really good. In fact, uh, there's this technology called Saffron that Adobe ships in Flash players, and that's exactly what it does. Like, it hints, and uh, it's an SDF based approach. It's sampling based, but adaptively sampled, which means like much closer to what I do, trust me not have the usual artifact. And the results look really good, to be honest. But it's not something I personally am interested in to look into because what I want is to just be able to zoom out from in and out without having to relay a text. But for uh, more like e-reading applications or with more like high quality display, but you might not have sufficiently high resolution and you're using this rendering stack, then Yeah, so uh, so ninety six is not my goal. 140, 160 plus, I'm interested in. And then it's really off your taste for text. If you're used to Windows rendering, you can't do without hinting. But if you're more used to the Apple, Adobe way of rendering, you actually like the more blurred out uh, grayscale rendering, then at 140 or 60, I may be able to provide that. But 96, there's no chance. Yeah. I have a question um, for, uh, about the, the basics of the algorithm. Um, you say that you pick the midpoint of the pixel and then look what's the distance to the closest outline. Right. Uh, what happens when you have multiple curve, curves contributing to the same pixel, which you would cover with a coverage based approach? Um, right. So, the question is, is yeah. You're, you're back to right. If you have a sharp corner, pixel center falling between, uh, the coverage based approach gets it right because it computes the actual 
public public this approach is noted. This approach assumes that the features are small or very large compared to the picture size. Okay. And that's given that's assumed by assuming a high density display basically. But uh, I do want to make a point that there are cases that this produces more uh, better looking results than the public case. It's just smoother and the analysing. Okay, so um, what I've got here, and it's on that display, I have no idea how it works. <laughs> on my ThinkPad, it doesn't look perfect, but on, on my Mac, it looks better. It's like just you have to do it down for and do it, all those nouns and parameters. But, but in general, this is like Shakespeare and then you like a can do it and then I can like do Oh, yeah, chapter. So I can do like these kind of things. And uh, to appreciate this, you have to notice that this is doing absolutely nothing on the CPU at this time. Like every frame is just one matrix updated on the CPU as driving every play. And this is like on my Intel. Linux 2 year old device is running on 40 DPI for, for this text. If I do it on my MacBook Air with NVIDIA, it runs at, I don't know, 300 frames. So uh, it's promising. It's not the fastest algorithm, but it's, it looks promising. And uh, oh, that's it. We have exactly 10 seconds for any final question. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Just you go and okay. that. Uh, okay. If you are not talking about extreme cases like this B you demonstrated, right. if, if you are talking about only more or less regular fonts, right. is it possible to hint font designers how to do the font which would work faster with your way? Well, uh, Basically, it's not some optimization in how we represent the shape. It's like if your font has a so for each cell, when we are trying to figure out what we need for this cell to represent the shape, if the closest arc we care about to this cell is one arc, and that arc arc is a straight line, we just encode it to use one texture root instead of three. So it's like uh, naturally, sans serif fonts are very very fast in this game, but like. The more curves, the more uh, details you have is just doing that. Okay, okay. Uh, let me uh, rephrase it slightly. If we are talking about two sans serif fonts, is it possible, uh, probably by the price of the shape changes in the font itself, uh, to make it one font, one sans serif font better than uh, over sans serif font in terms of uh, speed and memory consumption? Well, you could use circular segments for your other. Yeah, if your if your if your are like closer to simple arcs, that's going to be a blast. And okay. lines are a special case about simple arcs for me. Okay. So at the end of the day, it comes to like how how detailed your font is basically. Good. Thank you. We can talk offline because I don't want to eat into the end of Sure. You want to? Okay, cool. <laughs>